Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of The Real Deal. I'm Joshua Blakeney, and today I'm joined by a uniquely courageous Canadian guest, namely Arthur Topham. Mr. Topham has been criminalized not for committing any real crime, but for making political statements which the state in Canada deems illegitimate. That's right, under the so-called hate speech laws, which are being utilized to persecute Mr. Topham, the state can arrest you and fling you into prison merely for making politically incorrect statements. So Mr. Topham currently is being criminalized not for committing any genuine crime, but merely for the content of the statements he has made on his website, theradicalpress.com. And so the state in Canada seeks to impose, legally impose, the dogma of cultural relativism upon the Canadian people. In other words, Canadians are forced to believe the absurd notion that each and every culture is equally valuable, equally defensible, equally moral and ethical. And were we to observe the leadership, those who claim to be the leadership of a certain ethnic group acting barbarically, murderously, immorally, unethically, unethically we would not be allowed to criticise the leadership of that ethnic group without risking, as is happening to Mr. Topham, being criminalized. Welcome to 1984, ladies and gentlemen. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to the show, free speech warrior, Arthur Topham of the radicalpress.com. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for inviting me on. So before we get into the details of, of your persecution, perhaps you could tell the listenership, because I know much of the listenership is in the United States, and in the US they still have free speech. They don't have these uh, uh, draconian hate speech laws. So, so uh, what was the transition like in Canada? You know, Obviously, when you were a young man, there was free speech, and now there's not. Um, so how did that happen? Well, what are Canada's hate speech laws? What motivates them? Could, could you explain that to the listeners, please? Well, I think uh, I, when I was a young man, and that would be back in the 60s, uh, it was also the beginning, I think, of, 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 of this initiative by uh, lobby groups and so on here in Canada, you know, to start putting legislation into the federal legislation uh, that would prevent people from criticizing certain uh, certain groups of people here in Canada. And I believe it was the Cohen Commission uh, at that time. And then from then on, it was, uh, it basically was uh, the, uh, the federal government's position, uh, especially once, uh, once we had our repatriated constitution that, uh, took effect back in 1982 uh it was around that period of time that that uh people began to start feeling the effect of these laws uh which which were basically uh, thought crimes uh and, and what now is known as hate crime uh legislation uh it was happening not just here in Canada, of course. It was happening in other Western countries as well, too, because it's not uh, Canada isn't isolated in this in that respect. And uh, I'm sure, and I know because I'm in in constant communication with many uh, many people and many groups and organizations in the United States as well that there's a strong initiative down there to try to get rid of uh, the freedoms that they have there as well too but but it was uh uh certain cases that came up uh back in the 80s where individuals who uh, had made statements or were being critical specifically of the ideology known as zionism and uh and uh, in in relation to that the uh you know the policies and so on of the state of Israel. Uh, these, in particular, uh, were uh, issues that the that the uh, Jewish lobby groups here in Canada, especially you know groups like B'nai B'rith Canada and the Can Canadian Jewish Congress and so on, they had their uh, antennae up for any and everything that might, uh, you know, be negative in terms of criticism of, of either one of those, uh, uh, the ideology or the policies and so on of the uh, state of Israel. And then 
soon as they got wind of anything, <clears throat> they would use this legislation and accuse uh, these individuals of uh, spreading so-called hate towards, uh, you know, either they had different ways of expressing it, either the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Jewish religion or uh, people of, you know, Jewish ethnicity, this type of thing. And uh, that was around the time that uh, Canada's uh, one and only uh, barrister, uh, Mr. Douglas Christie, came on the scene and began defending these individuals. Uh, probably the most, uh, the most famous of Doug's cases was when Ernst Zundel was, uh, was charged in, in, a, in a similar case like that, and he defended him and and so on but it's been it's been ongoing since then and it uh it basically is now uh has has spread throughout the throughout the whole country and we've got uh you know uh groups like uh, hate crime units within the uh, RCMP located in many of the major cities and so on and and they spend an uh, you know, an enormous amount of money and time looking and searching for individuals who who might say the wrong thing on the internet and so on, that they can then turn around and 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 try to use these uh, these uh, hate crime laws against them. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're, the they're the thought police, that, aren't they? You, sorry, they're literally the thought police, right? They're there to decide which thoughts are legitimate. And which are oh yes, there's no difference between absolutely no difference between what George Orwell describes in you know in his book 1984 and or you know what we saw taking place in Stalinist uh, uh, Russia during the Soviet period there, where you know one wrong word or even not even a wrong word, just one accusation almost, you know, and next thing you know, you were uh, standing before a tribunal, you know, and uh, truth, of course, was not was not a justification for anything that you may have said. Now, this was all happening through uh, right up until actually until uh, June of, of 2012, this type of legislation, which was contained in the Canadian Human Rights Act. And that that took place uh, just after 9/11 uh, in the states. After 9/11, of course, uh, anybody down there knows what's happened there with, uh, you know, with all of their homeland security and so on and so forth. But in uh, at the end of that year in 2001, here in Canada, uh, the the lobbyists were uh, were able to uh, get right before the Christmas break. They were able to insert into the uh, Canadian Human Rights Act a section called 13.1. And in that section, it uh, it basically, uh, you know, enshrined this whole concept of, of uh, hate crimes uh, with respect to the Internet. Prior to that, I think the laws mainly had to do with, uh, you know, phone messages and recorded messages and things like that. But using the pretext of, you know, the threat of terrorism and so on, and that was when Canada brought in its Anti-Terrorist Act uh, around that same period of time. That's when they they were able to slip in this Section 13.1, and then from then on, they began in earnest to start harassing and uh, and uh, intimidating anyone and everyone who happened to post anything on the internet on either being a like as in my situation a, a publisher and a writer or anybody who just happened to be posting a comment on a blog or whatever it was it then became uh, it, it then became a uh, an offense. It was an offense at that time uh, under the under the Canadian uh, or the yes the Canadian uh, Human Rights Commission, and uh, which which basically is you know uh, quite a bit different from the from our uh, criminal system itself. It was more in line with the, uh, like I said, with the Stalinist system. Uh, if you were charged with a Section 13-1 hate crime, um, 
under uh, under uh, the Human Rights Commission, then they basically uh, had free play to uh, you know to uh, uh, haul you before uh, tribunals, and uh, it was. It was a situation where it was a foregone conclusion that you were guilty just because of the fact that uh, somebody had laid a complaint against you. And, and basically that, that was what happened, and that was when I first myself began to uh, experience the whole uh, human rights commissions and their tribunals and so on. Uh, and that would, that would have been back in 2007 when, I, when they first began attacking me and my website. So if you're able to say, say to us, um, what are the kinds of things that uh, you can get criminalized for saying in Canada? Because, you know, many of us are aware of the uh, disproportionate influence and power of Israel's supporters in North America. And obviously, throughout human history, kings and dictators have tried to find ways of preventing people criticizing them. And it just seems that the people who are in power in this country, or the people who form an important locus of power in this country, have somehow manufactured laws to enable them to arrest and throw into prison, literally throw into prison, like like Ernst Zundel, who you mentioned, uh, a German man who was against anti-German racism, who resided in Toronto. He was flung into solitary confinement with the light on 24-7, with his sheets being changed once every three months for the crime of espousing politically incorrect historical conclusions. And, and so we've seen this in history that, you know, regimes throughout the world have tried to create laws to prevent criticism of them. So what's, what's the kind of thing that you've been saying, if you're able to repeat those statements, that has led you to experience the wrath of these so-called human rights commissions, which deny you the human right of free speech? Uh, well, basically, um, you know, I first became aware of the whole Zionist uh, uh, factor, if you want to call it, or the Zionist connection within global politics, probably around 2004. So prior to that, I I had uh, began my publishing career back in 1998. I, I published a, a not, uh, not an online newspaper, a hard copy uh, monthly tabloid called The Radical. And I used to cover, it was, you know, it was advertised as an alternative media publication. And I, I focused on all kinds of uh, issues and so on that the mainstream media would not touch. Uh, but, uh, and that included, of course, doing a lot of research, you know, political research. And one, one, thing or another led to, of course, uh, uh, delving into the whole Middle East situation, because that has always been, uh, you know, a contentious, hot issue. And then throughout my own, uh, throughout my own studies and so on, and, you know, reading, reading, I, I believe it was probably Noam Chomsky uh, uh, in his book, uh, uh, where, he, where he talks about the whole conflict between uh, Palestine and Israel, that I first got wind of the uh, of, of the Zionists. Prior to that, I mean, if one uh, if one was relying on the mainstream media, you never heard the word even mentioned, uh, you know, in the Zionist press. So, you know, I started to uh, from there. I started to, you know, search more and doing more research, and then. Eventually, uh, a friend of mine sent me a copy of a book called The Controversy of Zion, which was written by a British, a British journalist and published originally. Uh, it wasn't published until 1978, uh, just after his death, but it was actually came out and was finished in 1956. And uh, a comprehensive study of the whole issue of Zionism going right back to, to biblical times and following it up through right through the, you know, right up to that period, especially especially the 20th century and the First and Second World War and, and, and the part that Zionism played throughout all of this. And after reading that, uh, you know, uh, basically everything, you know, all the, all the, uh, dominoes fell and and the, all the dots you know suddenly connected and then I, it be, I became you know you know basically aware of how and what was going on in the world and how how things were taking place so i began you know uh, to start publishing 
uh, either segments of, uh, of Reed's book, or as I was researching, I then became, began to collect all kinds of other uh, information that I gleaned and, and got off of, uh, you know, uh, searching around on the Internet and going to, you know, uh, places like Aid Books and stuff like this and finding a lot of literature that, uh, again, you will never see or hear uh, mentioned in the mainstream media. And 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 uh, as I began to read this, I, I realized that, uh, you know, that there was a lot of information that the general public was not privy to, and uh, and from then, so th these types of things uh, led me on to you know starting to write my own essays and so on and so forth, and uh, and it was uh, you know and because some of this uh, was appearing on my website, that was when. Uh, the uh, Jewish lobby groups here in Canada, like I say, they they're they're always scanning the internet looking for something, and they spotted uh, you know some articles that were on my website, and uh, true to form, on uh, on Valentine's Day, February 14th in the year 2007, I received uh, an email from a, a fellow by the name of. Um, well, he was actually using a, a pseudonym, and he called himself Brian Esker. In reality, his, he, it was Harry Abrams, who uh, was a representative of, uh, of the neighborhood Canada, and he sent me an email and, 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 and said, you know, you're publishing all kinds of anti-Semitic, racist uh, materials here. You're going to have to take them off your website, you know, uh, and so I wrote back a, a polite letter, and I asked him, you know, well, what is it in particular that you're worried about or concerned about, and uh, what specific articles is it that uh, you, know, you find offensive, this type of thing. And I never got a response back. You know, that was basically that was it, you know. And uh, so I carried on. And it wasn't until November of that same year that I suddenly uh, got a an unmarked large envelope in my uh, mailbox, and in it were documents from the Canadian Human Rights Commission and uh, an official complaint from them, and, and that then became the, the beginning of a long, drawn-out uh, process of, you know, of going through uh, all the hoops that they prepare for a person and so on and so forth. And, and eventually that case, it, it, it's, they're all known as Section 13-1 cases. That case carried on from then uh, right up until uh, that whole section was repealed by the, by the federal government here back in June of 2012. Although I should say that cases like mine, which were stayed um, because of uh, another case that was ahead of it, uh, those ones, even though that legislation now has been removed from the Human Rights Act, uh, cases that were pending uh, are still, there's still a good possibility, depending on what the outcome of the, uh, uh, there's a, there was a, another case uh, involving Richard Warman and uh, Mark Lemire that became uh, quite uh, prominent within the media and so on over the past few years. And that was a case similar to mine where Mr. Lemire had been charged under the same, under the same uh, legislation. And uh, eventually one of the tribunal members declared that uh, it was an infringement of his uh, charter rights. And so suddenly the whole thing stopped. And then uh, the Human Rights Commission then in turn appealed it. And it went in, actually jumped out of the, this quasi-judicial system that it was in. And it w then went into the federal court system. And, and that appeal uh, was heard just this past uh, November, but we're still awaiting the outcome of it. But in the event that uh, it uh, it uh, gets repealed, then I will ha be facing that, uh, having to deal with that that uh, Section 13.1 crime again, even though the legislation no longer exists. 
Yes, and the Supreme Court of Canada, 50% of which consists of Jewish judges, recently unanimously upheld part of Canada's uh, anti-free speech legislation. And the Jewish judge, Judge Rothstein, who wrote the verdict, did write that truth should not be a defense. He said a truthful statement could be interlaced with hate. This was in the Watcott case. Uh, and as yes, you're exactly right. Yes, I was just going to say that was the Watcott case, yes. And uh, and 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 again, you know, that's that, that's part of uh, the reason why you know they continue to uh, they continue to harass and uh, and try to shut my website down. Is is that you know these are the those are the types of in, of articles and information that I carry on my website where I disclose the fact that you know even though uh, you know the Jewish community here in Canada is less than. Two percent, it could be less than one percent, or somewhere in between. There of the population, we have this inordinate amount of Jewish judges, you know, sitting on the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, by definition, anyone you know who is Jewish is uh, automatically a dual citizen of whatever country they happen to reside in. Plus, you know, plus uh, the state of Israel itself. So there's, there's, in a sense, there's a conflict of interest right there when it comes to, you know, decisions and especially decisions that deal with hate crimes and so on. Because just about in every case throughout the last quarter century or more, these hate crimes are all directly related to either the state of Israel or to the Zionist ideology. Yes, you know, you never see anyone other than Christians being charged under these hate laws, even though since the fraudulent events of 9-11, we've seen immense amounts of anti-Islamic hate speech being propagated by Zionist journalists in the North American press. Uh, you know, I'm good friends with uh, the former head of the Canadian Islamic Congress, Dr. Mohammed El Masri, a distinguished Egyptian Canadian professor. And he told me when this hate legislation first emerged, or anti hate so called legislation, emerged. He was sanguine about it and felt positive and felt that maybe the discrimination against Muslims in this country, that there would be some recourse. But he said that he soon concluded, and to quote him or to paraphrase him, he said that these were tools of Zionist power in this country. So many people have now concluded that you know, the fact that it's only ever Christians who are perhaps making statements defending traditional sexual relationships, like, you know, Watcott, for example, was an obscure man in Saskatchewan who was um, disseminating hand-scribbled leaflets uh, denouncing sodomy. And, and, you know, rather than leaving him to his own devices or allow, allowing public intellectuals to ridicule or to criticize such a person, the state chose to criminalize that Christian person who was defending tradition and traditional uh, Christi Christian values as enshrined in the Bible. Um, so, so you never see Jewish people getting charged under these laws, even though some Jewish journalists are, are extremely uh, uh, vitriolic when they write articles uh, against Muslims these days. Well, that's that's a, a, an extremely important point, what you said, Joshua, because uh, the great deception, is, is from what I have been able to figure out uh, regarding all of these hate crime laws and so on, is and the reason why Section 13.1 was eventually repealed was because it actually was, uh, it turned out to be, first of all, they thought they had the, you know, the ultimate tool here to silence everybody. But when they started, you know, uh, making all, all these false accusations and spreading all this hatred towards, you know, the Arabs, the Muslim community, uh, then all of a sudden, uh, someone took them to task. You know, there was the case of Ezra Levant, there was the case of Mark Stain, you know, with his publications in, in McLean's magazine and so on. And suddenly they realized that it was a double-edged sword and it could be used against them. And then soon as that fact kind of hit home, then they started scrambling and, and trying to figure out, well, we've got to, we've got to get out of this somehow. Uh, we we want, and not only that, but of course they stress, you know, like in the National Post and so on, mainly the national.
freedom of speech and so on. Yes, you, you, the, just, you, just, cut, you just cut out there, Arthur, unfortunately, but I think we'll use this opportunity to, to go to the first break. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have to stick strictly no, to okay. the segments. Um, so we'll go to the first break now and pick this up after the break. Okay. Welcome back to The Real Deal, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joshua Blakeney, still here with the indefatigable Arthur Topham, a man who has been undergoing criminal proceedings for the so-called crime of espousing critical opinions of the Zionist community, who we all know wield an extreme amount of power in North America and are able to sway politicians and publish articles in the mainstream media and form opinion, but who it seems are to be inoculated by the law from counter-criticism. Now, Arthur, you were describing for us your experience having been criminalized under a series of laws. And of course, there's been a tension uh, between free speech advocates and pro-censorship advocates, because as you mentioned, some laws have been struck down. For example, I know Ern Zundel was originally charged under a draconian law going back to the year 1275 in British imperial law that Canada had inherited against the dissemination of false news. And you mentioned lawyer Doug Christie, who was your your lawyer, but unfortunately he passed away recently. He had um, taken some of these uh, cases to the Supreme Court of Canada and in the case of Nzundel was able to have the uh, anti-false news law struck down as being unconstitutional because since 1982, Canada uh, has had a constitution. Uh, It repatriated its constitution from the United Kingdom and power was devolved to Canada. Uh, which was formerly the Dominion of Canada, and Canada's had a constitution which does uphold freedom of speech. So there's this uh, interface between these lower down laws that are enshrined to promote censorship and the Canadian constitution, which on paper upholds the lofty uh, principle of unfettered uh, freedom of speech. So there has there have been some laws struck down. You mentioned there were some proceedings you were involved in uh, that was stayed, which means like it was kind of paused by the judge. You were neither found guilty or not guilty. It was stayed. <laughs> but uh, recently you've been recriminalized, haven't you, in, 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 a, in some secondary proceedings? Yes, yes, yeah. I, I was I was speaking before about the uh, Section 13.1 uh, hate crime complaint that was brought against me by B'nai B'rith Canada, uh, and that uh, that one was going through the whole quasi judicial system from 2007 right up until uh, I believe it was 2000. Uh, 10 or 11 when they finally stayed it because of another previous case that I was talking about, the Warman versus uh, Lemire case. Now, that one, because it was in the process and was stayed, is still pending, depending on the outcome of this, uh, of this appeal over the whole Section 13-1 issue. But uh, around the... 2012, and this was just before that. It was fairly evident, you know, from uh, from the behavior of, uh, uh, you know, the provincial or the federal government that sooner or later they were going to, you know, uh, repeal that section 13.1, and of course that would have meant that uh, these lobby groups that were trying to shut down my website would then. You know, they would have no recourse but to, but to uh, just leave me alone. But what they did do then was they thought, well, okay, uh, if that's not going to work, then we have to find some other ways of recriminalizing him. And that's when they, that's when they went to Section 319 of the Criminal Code of Canada, which also is a hate crime related section, uh, much more stringent. Uh, you need to have strong evidence and so on to prove, uh, you know, that uh, beyond a shadow of doubt. Of course, this is completely contrary to the the, the tribunal system and so on. Before they, there, they could change the rules as they went along from day to day. Uh, within the within the court system now, the federal court system and the and the criminal code, you can't, you know, they're, they're not able to do that. So they have to have some solid proof, you know, that you have committed, you know, a so-called hate crime. But what they did was, uh, like I said, uh, they realized this was coming down the, the track, and that sooner or later Section 13.1 would be would be rescinded. So uh, prior to that, even they 
laid a Section 13, or I should say a Section 319 uh, complaint against me. And, of course, the complaint was laid by the same person who had laid the original one, Harry Abrams of the Neighborhood Canada, he laid the same complaint with the hate crimes unit in uh, in Vancouver, and along with Harry was another, the same person who's been active, uh, you know, in in all of the Section 13.1 uh, complaints over the last 10, 15 years, and that was the lawyer uh, Richard Warman, who uh, uh, was making piles of money over over uh, laying these complaints and then fining the individuals and so on and so forth. So these same two people both laid a Section 319 complaint against me, uh, uh, which I was unaware of, of course. I didn't get a letter in the, in the, uh, in the post office this time. What happened was uh, they did this in, uh, in 2011, and I believe in the fall here. I, I don't remember the specific date. But in, uh, on May 16th of 2012, uh, when my wife and I were traveling up to Prince George on some mining business, suddenly a whole SWAT team of hate crime unit folks from uh, Vancouver, Surrey, suddenly swooped down on me on the Barkerville Highway, stopped uh, my vehicle, uh, got me out of the vehicle, read out the charge, and then arrested me and hauled me off to jail. And uh, ever since then, I have been dealing with that particular charge in the in the court system here now. And it's amazing, and that's all because of political statements you made. You haven't murdered anyone, raped anyone, uh, assaulted anyone. You haven't advocated violence. You haven't engaged in violence yourself. All you've done is post political statements on your blog. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, and uh, uh, I should qualify that with, uh, you know, with the flimsy excuse, you know, that uh, that these individuals representing the, you know, representing the, uh, you know, the Zionist lobby groups here in Canada, uh, you know, I know uh, that they were searching around for something on my website you know where they could uh, they could say oh well he's he's uh, he's uh, advocating genocide you know of the of the jewish people this type of thing because that, that if you, if you advocate anything like uh, you know genocide of a people then that falls under those categories well there was a, at the, at one point i uh, in my studies i had come across you know, a book that was published back in 1941 uh, by uh, a Jewish writer by the name of Theodore M. Kaufman. And this was uh, this book was published uh, uh, just prior to the American uh, uh, the America entering the Second World War. And of course, the Zionists were 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 very eager to get the Americans in on the side of the Allies and so on. So there was a lot of propaganda at that time against the German people and uh, Adolf Hitler and all of that sort of thing. So he published this book called Germany Must Perish, and uh, it's not a it's not a massive tome or anything. It's probably around a hundred pages or so. But uh, a friend of mine gave me a copy of it, and I read it through. And 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 I'm telling you, I just could not believe the amount of vile, hateful statements that were written in there about the German people. Not not specifically, you know, the National Socialist Party or or Adolf Hitler or anything, but the, but the German people as a whole. And I read this thing through and I was like I say, I was so astounded that I thought, well I gotta I gotta do something and then suddenly it clicked on me. I thought, you know, you could easily turn around, <clears throat> excuse me, and change the names and insert, uh, instead of putting Nazi, put Zionist. Instead of putting Adolf Hitler, you know, put Netanyahu who was some, something like that, hey? Instead of the German people, you know, or Germany, change the word Germany to Israel. 
So I did that, and I made a, a parody or a spoof or whatever you want to call it of this book, you know. And uh, I published it, and and when I published it on my website, I also did a preface explaining what I was doing. Eh? So of course these these uh, these lobby groups, they they you know they're on my website every day, looking and searching for something incriminating. So they saw this spoof, and it, what it said was. Israel must perish instead of Germany must perish. Well, they figured they had the cat, you know, in the bag then because I had, you know, in, in Photoshop, I had changed the name and I, you know, so it looked like it was an actual book published by me and so on. So, so they turned around and they used, uh, you know, stuff like that to, to, uh, in their, you know, when they filed their complaints to suggest you know that I was advocating uh, the genocide of the of, of Israel and all of the uh, the Jewish uh, race, say this type of thing or yeah. ethnic. Group. Yes, there's an attempt to portray those who argue and advocate for the one state solution in Palestine as being inciters of genocide. In fact, I heard Canada's Zionist influenced foreign minister John Baird say exactly this in a recent speech. He said. Those who don't support the existence of the Jewish state are not just advocates of hate speech or proponents of hate speech. They are, in fact, uh, inciting genocide against Jewish people, even though in the academic community now there's a vibrant debate as to whether uh, having a two-state solution, in other words, supporting the idea of a Jewish ethnocentric uh, entity in Palestine, uh, is better or worse than uh, having a democratic uh, Palestine where one woman, one man will get a vote each regardless of their ethnicity or denomination. Uh, and so the implication of this new discourse, which is to do with inciting genocide, as you stated earlier, I think many of these Zionist journalists and so on who are constantly defaming Islam, they realize that hate speech legislation was no longer expedient for their hegemonic agenda. You know, many Zionists are, are right now advocating a genocide in the Middle East, not tentatively, possibly someone might read Arthur Toppin's blog and try and implement a genocide against Jews 100 years from now. Right now, there's a genocide being implemented against the Muslim world with the implementation of the Oded Yenon plan, which promotes the dividing, the divide and rule of the Middle East and pitting confessional groups and ethnic groups against each other. For example, Coptic Christians in Egypt against uh, Sunni Muslims in Egypt, trying to encourage Arabs and Muslims to fight each other so Israel can rule the roost. So let alone this hypothetical genocide against Jews, which people like the members of the Benai Brith are criticizing you for apparently inciting, even though that seems like a, an implausible and unevidenced claim. There's an actual genocide going on right now against the Muslim world. But yet, if you question the the uh, constitution of Israel as a Jewish state for the Jewish people where any Jew in the world can come to live. If you question that, according to Canada's government and according to lawmakers and um, uh, the legal system in this country, you're inciting genocide. It's, it's quite absurd, isn't it? it? It's incredibly absurd. And uh, I wasn't aware of those statements by uh, by our foreign, quote, foreign affairs, unquote, uh, minister, John Baird there, but it doesn't surprise me in the least. I've been following and I've I have written articles and criticisms on him and, and some of the other some of the other uh, leading advocates, you know, uh uh for the whole Zionist cause here, including uh, you know, uh uh Erwin Kotler and and and, and Kenny and the rest of these, you know, troops. Not, of course, to leave out, uh, you know, the main advocate, uh, Stephen Harper here, you know, who kowtows and, and, uh, you know, does anything and everything to try to justify the, you know, the supremacism and racism and, 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 uh, genocide of the Palestinian people. Yes, indeed. I mean, this is the reality. I mean, we live in a country right now where our government prioritizes the national interests of a foreign country over the national interests of our own country is one of the most anti-Iranian uh, governments in the world uh, at the behest of Israel, it seems. And yet it seems if you criticize the power and influence of Zionists in this country, you're running the risk of being thrown into a dungeon in solitary confinement. I mean, it's absurd. Theresa Spence, the Aboriginal 
leader of the Atahualpascat people camped outside parliament last year and had a hunger strike. And even then, the prime minister and the government of Canada refused to go and meet with her to discuss the legitimate claims of Aboriginal peoples in this country. Interestingly, her main dispute was against the Zionist corporation De Beers, which is usurping diamonds in historic Aboriginal territories in that part of Ontario, Canada. And yet, if people look at Stephen Harper's recent performance at the Negev meeting to an Israel lobbyist of the Jewish National Fund, he not only came on, on stage and said, Israel is an island of democracy, and he referred to the Middle East that surrounds Israel as a something like a, a sea of darkness. I mean, using that's quite racist terminology, in my opinion. He then played music for about half an hour, a puppet performing for its puppet masters, as I called it. So the Zionists, who aren't the original peoples of this country, can click their fingers and have John Baird, Jason Kenney, Stephen Harper kowtowing to their demands. And yet the original peoples of this country, representatives of Aboriginal in this country can stage hunger strikes and not eat for, for weeks on end. And then, even then, the government of Canada, Canada will not even go and talk to those original peoples of this country. It's quite a double standard, isn't it? Oh, it's, well, it's, it's a double standard, but it is, uh, it's so uh, in keeping with the Zionist agenda, whether it's, whether it's here in Canada or whether it's in Palestine or anywhere for that matter, if there happens to be an indigenous group uh, within a country where they, uh, you know, where they're embedded themselves and, and have, uh, uh, you know, an inordinate influence over the governments, you know, and, uh, you know, these, you know, in my mind, and I've stated this on my website numerous times, uh, Stephen Harper, and people like John Beard and so on, because of the fact that they're they're basically aligning themselves with a you know with a terrorist state and so on. These people are committing seditious acts, as far as I'm concerned, you know. And I consider them to be traitors to this country, you know, where they're setting the the priorities of our so-called democratic nation, you know, um, in a second class or a second place, second class position relative to the wants and needs of the Zionist state of Israel, you know, and their arrogance, especially their arrogance uh, towards, you know, the aboriginal peoples of Canada, you know, is, you know, is, is just phenomenal. And of course, it's not really that too much out of keeping in in a sense with previous governments but uh uh tied in now we've never had a you know a prime minister of canada who was so blatantly pro israeli and pro zionist as we do with uh with stephen harper uh and it's it's just it's reflected in in the attitude of the federal government you know towards the aboriginal peoples and of course the modus operandi of the zionists is always you know either to uh spread and uh you know create dissension amongst you know groups and so on in order to have them like you said earlier you know fighting amongst themselves rather than focusing in on the primary target which is uh which is political zionism and its its agenda Yes, and thanks to the Jewish uh, judge in the Supreme Court, Judge Rothstein, you and I could be making truthful statements right now. Political analysts could accurately analyze the role of Zionism in Canada, but we could all still be th thrown into a dark dungeon uh, because truth is not a defense, because truth, according to this judge, Judge Rothstein, uh, it could be interlaced with hate. And let's just think about that. What's wrong with hate? If one can love, surely one can hate. Can't I hate Dick Cheney? Can't I hate Benjamin Netanyahu? Can't I hate the fact that the government, uh, which I, I pay taxes to, uh, prostitutes the national interests of our country and elevates the national interests of one of the most murderous regimes on the planet? I mean, what's wrong with hate? I mean, why shouldn't we be free to hate? That's a human emotion. I mean, it's just, just absurd uh, social engineering that these people are trying to to enact into law and have done so successfully well that's it that's it i mean uh, they take the language just as they 
you know, in a sense, stole uh, the word Israel. You know, the Zionists are, are an atheistic uh, uh, group. They're not the, you know, they never did advocate or, you know, uh, uh, connect themselves up directly, you know, with uh, the religion of Judaism. And yet, you know, they go in and instead of calling their their uh, their newfound country that they were able to coerce the rest of the world governments into into uh, you know forming back in 1948, you know they they take a term like they take a term like uh, Israel out of the Bible and then apply it you know to their secular so-called. Uh, Jews only state, you know, and that that was a, a big one. Of course, all of these terms that and words that they try to manipulate and change, they're all designed specifically to back up their, you know, their overall agenda. If it doesn't, if it, if they think that they can manipulate a word, and uh, and then use it, that's what they do. And and of course, that's what what they've done in terms of trying to take. You know the word hate, which is a, uh, like you said, you know it's the you know the opposite of the term love, you know, and we live in a dualistic uh, world here. So I mean, you can't suddenly just say, well, there is no such thing as hate, you know, or hate is specifically this, and it's uh, something uh, you know that only applies, you know, to uh, Israel or to the Jews themselves, and whenever they're being criticized, you know. Uh, for legitimate reasons, and there's countless legitimate reasons to to criticize the Israeli state and its policies towards not only Palestine but other Middle Eastern countries, as well as its inordinate influence throughout the world and in every other country. Uh, to try to equate that, you know, with some with, with hatred, and then have that term itself become a Actual criminal charge is uh, is it, it's it just shows the the level of uh, chutzpah you know that these people have you know they've succumbed you know to uh, you know they're just overwhelmed with their own sense of power and influence which again is tremendous you know but to use it to use that type of power and influence, you know, for these types of purposes, you know, goes contrary to, you know, goes contrary to human nature. Yes, and it's pretty illogical too the idea of incitement. So you and I could write or say something, but if someone else instigates violence and claims they did the violence because they read our words, you know, that we should somehow be held responsible. I mean, killing someone or using violence is already a crime in Canada. Actually implementing a genocide, even though it's impossible to do that <laughs> in this day and age, in this country at least, implementing a genocide is already a crime in Canada. So, you know, those of us who'd like to think the pen is mightier than the sword find ourselves potentially, or in your case, actually being criminalized and penalized when we're not using violence based on this illogical assumption that our words could incite somebody else to commit an act which is already a crime. I mean, it's already a crime to do violence. So why do they need to arrest us or criminalize us for our words? Uh, we're at the point of the, the next break, Arthur Topham of RadicalPress.com. I'm very much appreciating your discourse and your contribution to this discussion. So we'll pick this up after the break. Welcome back from the break, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joshua Blakeney, still here with Arthur Topham of RadicalPress.com. Uh, now, Arthur, I interrupted you when you were explaining the subsequent uh, criminalization of you by Canada's politicized law enforcers. Uh, you were driving down the highway with your wife, going about your business, trying to earn money to pay taxes to this government, which then uses those taxes to advance the interests of Israel. You were driving down the highway with your wife and you were swooped upon, to use your term, by police officers as if you were, a, uh, you know, a bank robber or something, but really you're a blogger. Uh, and what, what happened after that? So you found yourself then taken away from your wife and thrown into a dungeon um, because uh, this state intended to prevent you from speaking, right? Is that correct? Yes, that's precisely what happened, Joshua. Uh, they, uh, they handcuffed me after they read out the charge, and uh, 
they left. Fortunately, my wife, uh, you know, had her driver's license and uh, and was able to drive the vehicle into town. Uh, but they put me in a in a in a car and and hauled me off to the Quinnell RCMP uh, center and and booked me and uh, stripped me and all the rest of the stuff and then put me in a cell and uh, meanwhile and and and, and par- part of that and, I, and this I I haven't mentioned yet but I I think it should be stated now. Uh, while I was sitting in the cell, they were uh, desperately waiting uh, to get a phony search warrant uh, endorsed by a judge somewhere so that they could then come into my home. I live about uh, 30 kilometers out of, outside of the, the city of Quinnell on the way to uh, uh, Barkerville, on the Barkerville Highway, heading east from Quinnell in central British Columbia. So they, they wanted and were waiting to get this search warrant so that they could come into my home and search it and steal all of my computers and all of my electronic files. And uh, at the same time, when I was arrested uh, by Detective uh, Constable Terry Wilson of the British Columbia Hate Crimes Team, uh, he was the one in charge of the whole uh, SWAT operation, if you want to call it that, when uh, when I was in uh, when I was being booked or in jail, I forget actually at the time. He asked me whether or not you know I had any firearms in my home, and I explained to him, yes, I do have firearms in my home. I live out in the country. I'm a long ways away from any protection from any RCMP should anything happen, and I have livestock and so on. I have to protect. I got windows with plastic on them, and I've got uh, grizzly bears and uh, all kinds of predators in the area. So I do keep firearms for our own protection. And uh, so when they eventually got this uh, this uh, search warrant, they went in. Like I said, they removed all of all of my computers, all of my electronic files, and they took all of my firearms and then uh, absconded with all of that. So so I was left sitting in jail waiting to, you know, and eventually uh, you know, I was given the opportunity to make a call and, uh, and uh, Detective Wilson asked me, you know, who I would, uh, who I'd like to call. So I told him, I said, well, I would like to call uh, Douglas Christie. And he said, oh, I know Douglas Christie. He said, I'll, I'll get a hold of him for you right away, kind of a thing. You know, he sounded like they were the best of buddies or something. Uh, so he went and got a hold of Doug, and uh, I managed to speak to him. And then we, we had a couple of calls back and forth. And in and so I uh, I sat there until about, I think I finally got, released around 11 o'clock that night and my wife uh, was waiting for me outside in the van and and I I got out of then and uh, prior to getting out I was given uh, you know some uh, conditional sort of uh, or conditions that I wasn't allowed to you know go on the internet or post on my website or do a number of things and I was also charged with uh, unsafe storage of firearms because I I kept a loaded uh, Winchester in my house here because I don't have time to run around looking for uh, keys and so on and so forth when there's some, you know, when there's an animal comes in the yard. So it's a common practice, I think, amongst, you know, farmers and ranchers and people who live out of the city. But for them, it was like, oh, my goodness, we got another charge against them, too, and we can portray them in our... uh, you know, in the media and so on is, you know, first of all, they swoop down on this hate monger and then, you know, he's got firearms too, you know, so he must be extremely dangerous and a terrorist, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, they, they absconded with all of my stuff and, uh, and, uh, I did manage to get a hold of Doug and and I should say that uh, it wasn't just by coincidence or anything like that because uh, Mr. Christie had been helping me 
uh, for a number of years before that on a pro bono basis, really, with my Section 13.1 uh, uh, complaint charge that was brought on by the B'nai B'rith candidate as well. So Doug and I, uh, you know, we had been in communication for a number of years. And uh, so it was, you know, he was the immediate person to call, you know, when I was incarcerated. And that's that was it. And uh, so I was released then. And, of course, I was also restricted. I couldn't. It wasn't. This was on May 16th, 2012. And I was not able to, again, post on RadicalPress.com until the beginning of November. So there was a six-month period there when uh, my lawyer and I had to to get these conditions changed so that I could once again start to, uh, you know, uh, basically let all my readership and everyone know what had happened to me over that uh, six months of silence. Yes. Uh, so Doug Christie, he's obviously someone who we should all venerate and mourn the loss of because he was someone who time after time worked practically for free pro bono representing people who were criminalized for thought crimes, starting with the Keegster case here in Alberta, uh, where a, a school teacher was criminalized uh, because out of the classroom he was writing things which now turn out in, in many instances to have been vindicated, such as with respect to the establishment of a new world order. Many, many analysts now have concluded that there is a kind of Zionist uh, new world order being implemented that has been implemented since the Israeli false flag attack on 9-11, which did kill 24 Canadians. It's particularly disgusting that the Canadian government never investigated 9-11, never uh, acknowledged the Israeli connections to the massacre of 24 citizens, but is willing to abrogate and defenestrate our democracy and our right to freedom of speech, freedom of expression and freedom of the press in order to uphold Zionist uh, hegemonic interests uh, in this country. So Doug Christie has passed away now. Who who can you turn to now? Because there was only one Doug Christie. There will only ever be one Doug Christie. So who can you turn to now that has the integrity or perhaps even uh, a fraction of the integrity that Doug Christie had? Well, unfortunately, uh, through all of my efforts since that period of time, it looks like the only person that I'm going to be able to turn to, Joshua, is myself. Uh, because I've been unsuccessful uh, thus far in uh, being able to find, you know, a lawyer willing, you know, to take on a case such as mine, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Doug, of course, you know, was a shining knight in armor for anyone and everyone that had been charged with, a, you know, a, a hate crime speech um, who well, have been charged with with such a thing. Uh, and now that Doug is gone, of course, uh, no one else is willing uh, that I know of other than in, in civil cases. For example, in the, in the case of Mark Lemire and his battle with Richard Warman, his lawyer, Barbara Kalaska, has been an exceptionally uh, uh, powerful and uh, and positive voice in the same way, but Barbara, of course, is not a criminal lawyer, so I wasn't able to try to solicit her assistance in my own case here. But other than other than Barbara, and there's probably the odd person here in Canada that I'm unaware of at this point in time, and if they happen to be listening to this show, they're always welcome to give me a call because I'd be more than interested in speaking with them. But uh, prior to Doug's uh, passing away back in March of this year, he had already advised me that I should, uh, you know, because he knew that I was uh, financially unable to, you know, pay the, the costs for a, a long trial or even for all the preliminary work, that, you know, that's involved uh, that leads up to a trial, uh, that I should apply for what's known as a Robotham application, which is uh, a method whereby... Uh, if you can show that you uh, financially can't uh, afford to hire an attorney and your case is serious enough that the state itself uh, then is uh, it's incumbent on them uh, 
you know, so that your your charter rights and so on aren't infringed, and everybody is, you know, uh, uh, by the constitution and the charter uh, supposed to be eligible to have a lawyer to defend them, uh, that I could then apply for a Robotham application and hopefully through that, you know, find a lawyer to help me out with my case. And I have been working on that now for a few months since actually since Doug's passing, quite a few months. But I eventually had a hearing on it here just this past November. You know, I sent uh, the Attorney General of British Columbia tons and tons. I basically did a forensic audit of every every penny I had spent and every penny that had come in from donations and from my senior seven in February. So I'm on a I'm on a limited uh, pension. And I sent all this away, and then uh, a lawyer was sent up from uh, the coast here to Quinnell, and we had a hearing, uh, I believe it was on the 14th, but I, it escapes me at the moment. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, the decision then by the judge was that, you know, because I owned my own home, uh, that uh, I should be able to somehow borrow money against against it, uh, even though I have a, a major, you know, a major mortgage on it, and even though I've, you know, because of all this this uh, harassment, you know, by the Jewish lobby over the past six years or so, you know, uh, my my um, ways and means of making money. I used to run a small carpentry business on the side while I was publishing so that I could pay my wage sort of thing. And uh, that went uh, that went belly up because I was spending most of my time uh, dealing with the Human Rights Commission and so on. Uh, so I, they, they say, you know, and in the meantime, you know, credit cards went, uh, you know, berserk and I uh, wasn't able to pay them. And I, you know, I now have debts of about $27,000, you know, and, and I told the judge, I said, well, you know, I don't really think my credit rating is such that I'd be able to borrow any money, you know, to try to hire a lawyer, you know, which is the truth. But uh, they don't look at that, look at it in that way. They consider... They consider, uh, this is from the Attorney General Office's perspective, uh, number one, they don't want to give Robotham applications to anybody. They don't want the state paying for somebody's defense. You know, that's that's their main and you know, that's their first priority as far as they're concerned. So they set the threshold for uh, a person's financial eligibility so low that unless you're, you know, living under a newspaper or in a cardboard box and eating out of a dumpster, uh, you don't qualify. And, and then if you don't qualify financially, then they don't have to deal with the second aspect of it, which is the seriousness of the charge. And of course, that is the, that is the one, you know, that I wanted to uh, bring to their attention because I feel that this case against me is a very precedent setting case because if they're able to, if the, if the lobbyists are able to uh, somehow win it, and set a precedent, then they will then have what they want to replace that Section 13 uh, legislation, and they will use that precedent against any publisher, any blogger, any writer uh, in Canada here who does the same sort of work that I've been doing for the past 15 years. And this is the qualitative difference, isn't it? That earlier you did mention that Ezra Levant and is it Mark Steen had been charged, but of course they weren't ever criminalized. They don't have criminal records for their anti-Islamic statements because of course such Zionist journalists have access to the very best lawyers of the land and are in a position to push back. And there's a great selectivity in this, isn't there? Because basically, as far as I understand, the Attorney General of British Columbia or the Attorney General of Canada 
together has to consent when an application is filed for criminalizing somebody under anti-free speech legislation. He has the he or she has the final say, and so there's great selectivity. And it seems that if criminalizing someone who's a proponent of anti-Islamic hate rhetoric is politically inexpedient in Canada, they invariably won't be um, criminalized. But when it's someone who doesn't have the means to defend themselves, someone who's just trying to express their uh, dissent in this so-called democracy on a blog, and, and they know they're, they're weak and vulnerable, then that is politically expedient to make an example of this person. And so basically, you're in a position now where you have to self-represent because your, uh, your knight in shining armor, Doug Christie, unfortunately passed away from cancer, and there's no other Doug Christies who are willing to st step up to the plate and defend you out of principle. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, aren't you? Yes, at this point in time, I definitely am, Joshua. Uh, like I say, uh, there's probably going to be a, a fairly long period of time between now and when uh, an actual trial takes place. Uh, I have a preliminary hearing coming up on January 22nd of 2014, uh, and uh, following the outcome of that, uh, I will know then whether or not the case is going to be either thrown out or go, or whether it will go to trial. Uh, according to uh, Crown Counsel and according to uh, the, the judge and so on, uh, chances of it being thrown out at the preliminary hearing are very slim and that most Times uh, they don't have to prove very much. Of course, that's very convenient for them because they don't have anything to uh, substantial, or, you know, as it is, you know, the the uh, the, the information and the, that they did use in order to arrest me in the first place was all fabricated lies and nothing that they used uh, in order to gain the search warrant and so on uh, can be substantiated and proven in a court of law. But uh, nonetheless, they intend to carry on and, and drag out this thing as long as they possibly can. Uh, fortunately for me, I suppose, uh, the provisions... Difficult for them, and uh, maybe. Uh, at, Can you just repeat that? Next... You, you cut off for a few seconds. There. What, what, oh, what I'm sorry. Saying? No, I'm saying that uh, you know, fortunately for me, the provisions in the Criminal Code of Canada uh, make it uh, very difficult for them to prove their case of hate against me, and and uh, and uh, these things here. Uh, at some point, possibly, we could talk about that, you know, uh, the whole Section 319 uh, criminal code charge itself, because it's not in any way uh, akin to the type of legislation that was used even in the Watcott case, you know, which wasn't a criminal case. That, again, was a, was a, a human rights uh, issue, as far as I know. Yeah, and if the if the veracity of your statements uh, are not of interest to the court, in other words, if it if the true if what you said was true is not a defense in court, what exactly are they trying to establish, and what would you have to establish in order to exculpate yourself? Like that, presumably you'd have to establish that what you uh, opined was not. Uh, espoused with the intention of inciting genocide or inciting hate against Jews, because you have specifically been charged with uh, willfully promoting hatred against the Jewish ethnic group and religion. So they refer to the Jewishness of your alleged so-called crime uh, in, in, in the indictment, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, that's correct. No, I mean, the, the, uh, the, their, their whole uh, argument, you know, and again, you know, this was something that, uh, like I, when I made reference to that particular uh, vile and nasty piece of hate literature that uh, they put out called Germany Must Perish, uh, they were 
they were basically trying, you know, to use, you know, my parody as as a justification to claim, you know, that I'm trying to incite genocide, you know, against the uh, the present day uh, Israeli population and uh, and the uh, you know the Jewish population as a whole. It was interesting uh, throughout uh, my uh, arrest by Detective Wilson that he kept on throwing that out. You know, when I when I finally he released me from the Fell, I said to him, well, so what am I charged with anyways? He said, he said, you're charged with genocide against the Jewish population. You know, he didn't have his, uh, he didn't have his, uh, his, uh, terminologies correct or whatever there, but the, that was basically what they were trying to do. And with respect to that, I just want to, I just want to go back and revisit uh, what I was saying about that book. And, uh, and, and for, for good reason, uh, you know, right at the outset of it, uh, the writer makes this following short statement. He says, this dynamic volume outlines a comprehensive plan for the extinction of the German nation and the total eradication, eradication, excuse me, from the earth of all her people. Also contained herein is a map illustrating the possibility of the possible territorial dissection of Germany and the apportionment of her lands. And then on the back cover of this book, uh, we see the following uh, uh, promotion here from Time magazine, they put a sensational idea. From the Washington Post, a provocative theory interestingly presented from the New York Times, a plan for permanent peace among civilized nations. And the Philadelphia record says, frankly presents the dread background of the Nazi soul. That's the kind of literature that they were publishing. And then they turn around and try when I make fun of it, turn around and try then to say that I am proposing, you know, to eradicate and and uh, and genocide the, the Jewish people. Yes. Yeah, so this is how flimsy of an of a, of of of, a, of of evidence that they have. But out of their desperation, you know, knowing that the uh, Section 13 one was going to, you know, conclude and that they would they wouldn't be able to then attack me. That's the kind of stuff that they decided that they would take a chance on trying to use in a in a federal court, you know. Yeah, so you were criticizing the advocation of genocide as contained in the uh, genocidal tract, uh, Germany Must Perish by Theodore Kaufman. And to demonstrate the outlandishness and the murderous intentions of Kaufman, you uh, supplanted Germany and National Socialism with phrases like Israel and Zionists, not with any intention to advocate genocide, even if that was possible in this day and age. Israel has nuclear weapons. The Jewish community are uh, in no uh, way vulnerable in this society or in this era. Um, but to, your, your, your intent was not to promote genocide, but was to criticize those who in the past have promoted genocide. Um, so it seems that their whole set of allegations against you arise almost in defense of uh, the promotion of genocide by Kaufman because you were the critic of Kaufman and you're being criminalized for having exposed that author's uh, genocidal intentions. And also I think another weak point they have is the conflation of Israel and the Israeli people uh, with Jews. Because Israel, Israeli, is not an ethnicity, right? As we're constantly reminded, 20% of Israeli citizens aren't Jews anyway. And moreover, many uh, intellectuals, for example, Ali Abu Nima, who runs the Electronic Intifada, I've read his book on the One State Solution. I think he's a professor at Sh University of Chicago, uh, have advocated the uh, One uh, State Solution. Uh, in other words, dismantling the Jewish state as We've seen, for example, the Soviet Union dismantled, like states do get dismantled uh, in recent history. We've seen that dismantling the, the Zionist entity and creating a democratic state with equal rights for all citizens. Actually, that would be it would be more logical than for Canada to be an ally with that state because Canada is a multicultural society and the Zionist entity is an ethnocentric, largely monocultural uh, society, which has, you know, we're always told Israel has the same values as Canada. It, 
it seems the opposite of Canada. But but yes, I mean, I think in your defense, number one, saying things about Israel is not in any way promoting. I mean, genocide refers to a group, right? An ethnic group. Uh, Israeli is not an ethnicity. And in addition, it seems your whole intention all along was to critique those who have historically uh, promoted uh, genocide. So I don't really think they have a strong case against you. No, I don't think they do either. And it begs the question as, as first of all, it begs the question as to why they would have gone out on such a, uh, you know, on such a limb in order, you know, but when you consider that, uh, you know, they've been on my case, so to speak, you know, for the last six, seven years, uh, it, it's, it doesn't surprise me that they would do it. What surprises me more would be that the attorney general's office in looking through the evidence and so on, that they would have been willing to become accomplices or, you know, in, 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 in actually following through and not throwing the bloody thing out right at the yeah. start. Yeah, so we're just going over our time for this segment. So we'll go to the break now and we'll come back for the final segment. And you can then tell the listeners how, if they want to, they can help you, donate to you, uh, or if a lawyer is listening, how they can contact you. But we'll go to the break right now. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, welcome back to The Real Deal. This is the final segment. I am very uh, glad to have been able to bring Arthur Topham to this audience, this highly uh, educated audience. This is uh, Professor Fetzer's uh, radio show, and he commands a highly educated uh, listenership. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, Arthur Topham of RadicalPress.com, uh, how people, if they want to, can donate to your uh, struggle, can help you in some way. And then after that, I would appreciate if you'd sort of explain to us a little more just about yourself. Because one thing I, I find amazing in this is, you know, you're, if it's not pejorative to say this, you know, you're a working class guy, right? Uh, and yet I notice when you're writing, you're very articulate, far more intelligent than professors I've met at university. I spent six years on campus in university in Canada. You know, your, your analysis is far more accurate, in my opinion, than anything I, I read in political science books on university campuses. So, so how did you come to be so astute? Like, what's your, uh, what's your intellectual uh, background? Like, are you, are you a self-educated man? Did you uh, attend university as a young man? Like, how did you come to be so um, sophisticated in your articulation of these highly controversial issues? Well, <laughs> I would say it's a combination of uh, everything there that you've mentioned. Uh, of, uh, I'm a type of person, I suppose, that would be what you would call a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, I've spent the majority of my life uh, doing different jobs at different times, and uh, but at the same time, I also, when I left high school back in 1965, I entered uh, the uh, university called Simon Fraser in Burnaby, British Columbia, which was then a brand new university uh, that had opened up that same year. And uh, it, of course, uh, at that period of time, acquired a reputation as being, you know, the most radical university in Canada at the time. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, now that I uh, have learned a lot since I left there, uh, uh, the main reason for that was because, uh, you know, they f filled that university, you know, with all kinds of uh, Marxist uh, professors and so on from around the world and the States and Britain and so on. And they promoted, you know, a lot of political science uh, uh, courses and classes, you know, and, and it was basically, I, you know, give it whatever you want to call it, a leftist university, whatever. Uh, so I, I spent, uh, I spent, uh, four years there and in, during that period of time, but, it, uh, and I did, uh, study, I did study political science, but, but my main, my main, uh, 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 point in being there was that I was planning on being a school teacher. And, uh, the outcome of that was that I did, I was, I, I got my teaching degree and I taught for a number of years in elementary schools, uh, right from teaching kindergarten up to grade four and five. I wasn't, uh, 
I wasn't working in the upper grades or anything like that. I preferred to, you know, to work with uh, young minds, I suppose you would call it, who were still open and susceptible, and and you weren't always battling with them over discipline problems and this type of thing. So I I did spend off and on a period of about five years after I graduated working uh, within the British Columbia school system and also within the uh, the federal Indian Bay school system uh my first job was actually teaching in a, on a native reserve up past prince rupert uh, in british columbia here and then uh, from there i transferred down to the area where i have been living now basically since 1970 and uh i got a i got a teaching job in uh, in the quinell school district and and i taught here uh, for a couple of years and uh and then I decided that I'd had enough for that, and I wanted to go into some other businesses. My other great love is, is building and construction and so on. And uh, so I, I ended up, uh, you know, becoming a log builder and uh, building homes and, and doing those types of work. And from that, I got into the... Uh, uh, I, I, I then got into working for the provincial park system. I became a park ranger for a number of years. I worked uh, in that capacity, and then uh, eventually got back into a bit of a bit of teaching again. And I then uh, went from there to Bella Coola, British Columbia, which is a uh, a large native uh, uh, community on the on the west coast on the inlet. And I worked down there in native schools for a couple of years and uh, and then came back up here and continued doing on-call teaching and so on and so forth. Uh, and eventually, uh, um, I got into a bit of, a, again, a, a similar type of a problem when I, uh, I had always been since the 70s actually since i would i would say since 1968 was the first time that i i uh, wrote a letter to a, an official newspaper and had it published and then uh, i became an avid writer after that uh, writing mainly letters to editors for uh, for a number of years and then when i established myself in the local Quinell community here i became uh, a regular contributor to the Quinell Caribou Observer, uh, which is the community newspaper here. And I wrote for them for a number of years, and then eventually I, uh, they offered me a position of a, of a columnist for the newspaper there, too. So I, I also uh, performed in that capacity for a while. And uh, But while I was on call teaching, I was writing letters to the newspaper at one point, advocating you know, the legalization of marijuana. Uh, and at that time, uh, the community, certain segments of the community decided that that wasn't a very good thing for me to do. I, I wasn't, advo in a sense, like Keekstra, I wasn't advocating it in, in the classroom or anything, but because of my position as a, a professional in the, in the town, they felt, you know, that I shouldn't be doing that. So, so uh, the school district called me to task and uh, they uh, said to me, well, if you're going to write any more letters, Mr. Topham, to the local newspaper on issues such as this, you're going to have to uh, submit them to us first and we will go through them and, and decide whether or not, uh, you know, they're politically correct or not and uh, so on and so forth. So at that stage of the game, I said, well, okay, if, if, if this is the way you want to uh, you know, this is the way you want to treat me as a, you know, and, and start restricting my freedom to express my own opinion and so forth. Well, that's it. So I, I resigned from the teaching profession and created my own newspaper at that time in 1998, but the first edition coming out in, in June of 1998, it was a 24 page, uh, tabloid that came out once a month. And, uh, I ran that for 42 consecutive uh, editions until it finally, I, from financial pressures and also from being attacked legally uh, on other issues for exposing certain things in the provincial government here, I, I eventually had to shut that down. So, so I've been writing for a very long time and... Uh, as an old friend once told me, he said, if you want to 
learn to become a writer, you must write. And so that's what I, that's what I've been doing for quite some time. And, and I suppose it now shows up in, in, in my, uh, in my work, especially when it comes to exposing what I feel are, are the, the corrupt elements within the Canadian society. And do you feel yourself to be quite isolated or do you have a network of supporters and friends like, you know, other people who have been persecuted for thought crimes uh, in this country? Oh, yes, definitely. No, I don't feel isolated at all. I I have, uh, you know, ever since I started going online and even prior to that, when I was publishing my newspaper, I had subscriptions, you know, from from readers throughout the States, throughout all of Canada and other parts of Europe and so on, I, you know, and from that, and then when I went online, of course, and, uh, and had Radical Press going online, uh, you know, I started to build up a readership and uh, and build up uh, you know a connection with people around the world and that and that has never ceased and if you've been in the publishing business especially the alternative business and survived for 15 years usually you then have a lot of connections with other people within that same uh, that same media you yeah. know so i've had i've had that i still have <clears throat> excuse me uh contributors uh you know to my website who were originally uh, uh you know writers who wrote for the hard copy edition 15 years ago type of thing and so, so uh, yeah yeah so i mentioned- not, i don't know i don't feel isolated at all well, well, I think that's very important, and I think that you have a lot of um, people who know that what you're saying is truthful, and hopefully uh, Canada will uh, return to being a country one day where truth is legal, because <laughs> it seems that certain truths are illegal uh, in this country nowadays. Now, I referred earlier to Ern Zundel having been incarcerated in Toronto in solitary confinement for two years with the lights on 24-7 for the crime of drawing politically incorrect historical conclusions. David Irving, uh, a once esteemed British historian, without whose work we wouldn't know about the the, uh, the Holocaust in Dresden, because he was the man who brought that to the fore, he was put on an Air Canada plane, on the floor of an Air Canada plane, in handcuffs, and deported so the Canadian state could prevent him from speaking. What's the worst case scenario with your case? You know, just to hit home the the magnitude of the human rights violation that is being visited upon you by the so-called Human Rights Commission, this Orwellian body that violates people's human rights for freedom of expression, freedom of the press and so on. What's the worst case scenario that, that could transpire in your case? Well, there's 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 two aspects to it, Joshua. Uh, in the event that the Lemur case with Warman, um, if that appeal is upheld and uh, they then turn around and start, uh, you know, putting me before the tribunal and so on and so forth, uh, then that in itself could ensure that they found me guilty and they would try to, you know, uh, order me to take down my website and to not write any more articles related to uh, Zionism or anything to do with that whole issue for the rest of my life. There's that possibility. Uh, But when it comes to the Section 319 criminal charge against me, uh, if they were to succeed in finding me guilty of that particular charge, I could end up getting as much as a two-year jail term out of that. Plus, I'm sure they would try to also take down my website and prohibit me from any further writing. So it's a the Section 319 one is the critical one right now and the most important one that that I win because if I lose everyone in Canada will lose that that is in a similar position that I am in and how has the media treated you? We referred to an individual named Ezra Levant earlier. He's uh, one of the the leading presenters on the Sun News Network, which although being uh, thoroughly Zionist, thoroughly against uh, anyone who stands up to Israeli uh, hegemony in the Middle East, 
it has been uh, advocating uh, free speech in this country in a kind of Zionized way. You know, they, they want to have free speech and we know why, because they want freedom of speech to, to criticize the Islamic community. So most of the media in this country are, are pro-hate speech legislation. But, but then you have Sun News, which is 99% uh, repugnant to people like you and I. But on this one topic, they have been slightly more in our camp. Would that be fair to say? Uh, on the surface, Joshua, it would be fair to say that. But when you delve into their rationale for that, of course, it's exactly what you just alluded to. They want freedom of speech because they control the vast majority of the media, and they want the freedom to bash and to and to uh, you know denigrate the Muslims in Canada and around the world and promote Zionism. And they know damn well that if they're allowed to do it, sure, people like me can oppose them, you know, and other bloggers can oppose them. But they know. They know that they control the media in the Western world. And they know that given that uh, license where they can't in turn be turned around and charged by Islamic groups or individuals for promoting hate, then it's all in their favor to have that. It's like an open road for them. But it's not because they want they want to uh, you know be able to then present you know the full story or both sides of the story. They want that license, you know, to attack Islam and to attack the Palestinians and the Middle East and so on and so forth. And that's why Ezra Levant and his crew at the Sun News uh, Media Network are uh, are so uh, anxious. You know that uh, we we uh, not have these hate crime laws in Canada. You don't see them though speaking out against you know th this other one, this provision that I've now been charged under. As a matter of fact, uh, when the indictment came down last November of 2012, uh, my lawyer Doug Christie got a hold of me right after the indictment. I think the indictment became public on the 5th of November. And he asked me whether or not uh, I would be willing for him to go on and uh, and do an interview with Ezra Levant on his, uh, on his show called The Source on, uh, on uh, Sun News Media. And I said, yes, sure, go ahead, uh, go for it. And uh, it was during that interview which was which was basically broadcast across the Canadian uh, media from one end of the country to the other, and of course accessible around the world. That Ezra Levant sat there and came right out and said, "I hate Arthur Topham," and then he proceeded, you know, to call me down and accuse me of being an anti-Semite and a racist and you know, that I was a no-name nobody and that, uh, you know, a, a basement blogger, you know, who hated Jews and on and on and on and on, vilifying me, you know, on his show. And one would, uh, but of course, at the same time, out of the other side of his mouth, he's going, oh, isn't it wonderful, you know, that we have freedom of speech and that we can say what we like and on and on and on. But what he was really doing, you know, and then, of course, all the all the Zionist media, all the major newspapers around the country the next day were all basically uh you know, slandering and vilifying me and my work in exactly the same way that Ezra Levant was doing. So this is this is how they work it. You know, it's you know, if it's uh, advantageous for them, you know, they promote something positive. But if it's anything that's critical of Zionism or critical of the state of Israel, then they do everything in their power, you know, to uh, basically defame a person and, you know, give a, the public a false impression of what that person's work is and what he is, you know, what his purpose in writing is all about. Yeah, it seems like there's a dispute within the Zionist community. There's some like Ezra Levant who say, well, unfettered free speech is more expedient for us, whereas there's other Zionists who say, no, actually, censorship laws are advantageous for us because it, it 
not only allows them to criminalize critics of Zionist power, it also strikes fear into the hearts of many people who would otherwise be sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians, but who may be deterred from delving into anti-Zionist subjects because deep down they have at the back of their minds the realization that you can be put in prison if you too zealously challenge the power of Zionists in this country. Hello. Yeah, so I think we just got cut off there, uh, Arthur. So we're just uh, entering the last five minutes of the show. Would you like to take this opportunity to uh, explain to the listeners exactly how they can contact you or donate to you or help you in any way? Uh, yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in dire need always of, of, of financial help here to, you know, this, this whole uh legal process means that i'm unable to really spend time you know being gainfully employed anywhere else and uh, any financial help that that uh, could be forthcoming is always appreciated uh all of the information uh, as far as uh you know either sending you know money or checks or so on to my post office and so on uh or using my paypal uh, all of that is on the front page of my uh, website, radicalpress.com, and uh, right on the toolbar at the top, you can there's uh, there's some uh, uh, places there to check, and right up on the right hand corner is my PayPal account, and and uh, if anyone feels that uh, you know this case is is is, uh, is important and wishes to help out. Uh, they're more than free to click on that button and help me, and it would be most appreciated. Perhaps you could just sum up in the last few minutes, what would be your ideal outcome of this? Obviously, to be exonerated, but what would you like to see happen in Canada for us to become more democratic, and especially with regard to these laws? I mean, do you think in the long term they're going to be done away with i mean obviously we've it's it's noticeable there is a debate arising within the zionist community uh you have people at like ezra levant who are sort of suggesting that actually free speech is better for us zionists we should pursue the goal of uh unlimited free speech and then there's other zionists perhaps the ben i brith comes to mind who say no these hate speech laws are good because obviously hate speech laws they also instill fear in the public don't they because they there's the deterrent uh, and the threat that if you criticize Zionism too zealously that you might actually uh, end up in in a dungeon. Um, so, 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 which faction of the Zionists in this debate that which seems quite Zionocentric do you think will win? The faction that says, "Look, let's just uh, do away with these hate speech laws because they're actually bad for us Zionists too," or do you think the the Ben I Brith Simon Wiesenthal Center, who actually I, I must add, to tell the listeners often get special hearing at these trials? Like I I heard Watcott. He was saying that during his trial, like the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Bernay Brith actually get like a special recognition by the court. <laughs> Just if anyone was doubting that when you were saying this was done at the behest of the Bernay Brith, well, they actually get recognition in the court. But um, do, do you think that that faction will win out and these laws will will uh, continue to be on the books in Canada? Or do you think eventually the the pro free speech faction of the Zionists will 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 succeed? Well, I'm hopeful that the second will, but we have to always bear in mind that B'nai B'rith Canada is a creation of the Rothschild Empire. They created it, and it's a it's a secret Masonic order. It's powerful. It's the most powerful voice for the Rothschild criminal cartel, and uh, whether or not they will be defeated again is is it's a it's a it's a it's 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 difficult for me to say uh the only thing that i can say is that without you know free speech in this country we're doomed doomed to end up you know falling under the under the the total control of this zionist new world order 
Indeed. And of course, as I said earlier, the Supreme Court of Canada did recently uh, uphold uh, certain elements of Canada's uh, anti-free speech legislation, which obviously is something to be pessimistic about because it's very hard to overturn uh, Supreme Court decisions because that supersedes all other uh, decisions rendered by judges in this country. Um, so we can uh, we can end the show now. So I'd like to thank you, Arthur Toppen, very much for, for joining us on this episode of The Real deal. I'm sure much of the listenership will be extremely distressed to hear about your plight, to hear that someone who didn't engage in violence, didn't do anything egregious, but rather merely expressed uh, political opinions on his blog, may uh, in a worst case scenario end up being in prison for two years uh, and has already undergone severe uh, infringements of his rights, including having his computers taken away and his guns taken Taken away and having uh, been put in, in a jail cell already. I'm sure many people will be distressed to hear this. I'm sure many Americans will be realizing the import of uh, the First Amendment, which upholds free speech in that country. Uh, we should warn them from Canada, of course, that we do have uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press and freedom of expression protected on paper in our constitution. But it seems in practice the whims of uh, censorious Zionists uh, superseding the supreme law of Canada. So, Arthur, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your selflessness and for defending all of our rights to be able to criticize anybody in this country, but in particular, the locus of power of Zionism, which has such an influence, such a hegemonic uh, role, unfortunately, uh, in Canada. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Joshua, for having me on your show. I definitely appreciate it.